Like Pastor mentioned, we're doing something a little bit different, and I am so excited for tonight. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Josh. I have the privilege of hanging out with our high school and college students every Wednesday night, and I want to welcome all of you guys out tonight. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we're doing something a little different. We're doing what we call five minutes of fire. So we have five students that are going to be speaking right to my left. They're going to be speaking for five minutes, giving it everything they've got, and here's what I need from you. I need you to be loud. I need you to shout them down. I need you to get excited. This is a party in here. We're going to encourage them, and we're going to cheer them on as they preach fire tonight. And so we're excited to go. I'm going to introduce you to our speakers tonight. First, right here, this good-looking young man is Gabe Brown, and Gabe is awesome. He's one of our students in the U, one of our leaders in the U. Amazing. Next up, we have Kalista Midas. She's one of our School of Leadership students. And she is amazing. Up next, we have Colin. He's also a school of leadership student moving into his second year. Then we have Jasmine Matthews. She is a high school student, so she's amazing as well. And then Alexa Arbentrout. She's also a high school student, part of our United High School. And so we're excited. Can I have you do this? Can I have you just practice what we're about to do? Because when they preach it down, I need you to make it loud in here. So on the count of three, can you just get as loud as you can, just so I know that this is going to go the way that it needs to. Ready? One, two, three. You go. All right. All right. I think we have it down. So can we do this? As Gabe comes up to the front, as he comes to center stage, can we chant for him? Ready? Gabe, 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 Well, hello, Faith Family Church. All right, well, hey, who's ready to go? Let me hear you make one more shout for Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, hey, let me ask you a question. What if everything that you spoke from this moment forward came to pass? Would it change what you said? All right, well, hey, as we get started today, why don't you go ahead and turn to one of your neighbors, tell them the title of my message today, say, what even? What even? What even? All right, well, hey, I was doing a little research uh, this week on the message and what I was going to talk about, and I found the definition of a good message. And a good message, it has a good beginning, a great ending, and those two are as close together as possible, right? So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to get started a little under five minutes to go, but I want to talk to you about the power of the tongue, all right? Let's get right into this. Proverbs 18, 21, it says, death and life. Everybody say, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Let's keep that in the back of our minds. As they love it, it sh- er, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, the first mentality that I would like to talk to you about is one that I like to call the what if mentality. Can everybody say what if? Yeah. What if? Now, people who have this what if mentality, they say things like, well, well, what if I fail this exam and I don't make it through college? You know, what if, uh, what if I'm, I'm 65 years old and I'm working this job and, you know, they're not doing so great right now. And what if I lose my job and, and I'm not able to cash in on that retirement? Or, or you know, what if, what if I'm living my life for Jesus, but then I, I slip and I fall? You just, I mean, does God really still love me? Come on. And so I believe that with all my heart that we do have power in the tongue and over what we say. Proverbs 17, 27, it says this. A truly wise person uses few words, few words. He uses them sparingly. He thinks before he speaks. He says, he said, come on, you can clap. You can clap. That's right. Now we aspire to be wise in our own doing, but we can't do that without Jesus. But I believe that as a wise person, we like to take our time. We we like to think and rehearse before we say, I think that that is how we're able to live a wise life. Because I truly believe that the fewer the words, the more mission minded our mouths will become. That as we continue to speak life into our lives, into other people's lives, we continue to build ourselves up, that we will see that our words, when they have a purpose, that we will see God be able to use them in our lives. That we'll be able to see our, the paths in front of us. As we speak, we say, God, use me. God, change my life. God, take me from where I am to where I want to be. That God will do it, and he'll change your life for the better. Amen? Amen. All right, all right, come on. All right, we got, got a couple minutes to go. So the next mindset here, we have the what if mentality, but now we have what I want to talk to you about is the even if mentality. Now the what if mentality, it, it can kind of get bogged down because we have a lot of you know, doubts and fears. It can kind of, it's so easy to slip into that kind of mindset. 
But I believe the even if mentality, if we go ahead and take that on today, we go ahead and take that on this week, that it will truly change your life. So the even if mentality, people, we walk around and we say things like this, that even if God shows up in my life, he shows up in everything that I'm doing, but even if I make so many mistakes, does God really still love me? Yes, he does. Even if, even if I show up every single day, but yet I still make mistakes and I still slip up, God is still faithful. He still has a plan for my life. He's still going to show up whenever I need him to. That even if, even if I work every single day, every single hour at my job, and then they still fire me, and the devil still comes at me with all those addictions and temptations and things that come my way throughout the week, that even if that God is still faithful, that he still has a plan for my life, that he's still going before me and he stands behind, that he is alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, come on. So we have the what if mentality and the even if mentality. When I was a kid, I uh, was around 12 or 13, I came to the realization, the revelation of who God really is to me and the power that I have in my words. Because I read this passage and I said, okay, if death and life are in the power of the tongue, then and I believe that, hey, I can speak the word and it's going to come to pass, then I also have to believe the opposite. That I can also speak negatively and see those things in my life as well. I mean, come on, somebody. So if you're going to speak life into your life, I truly believe that you have to give your words the recognition and the honor that the Bible does. Amen? You have to, you have to say, even, you know, the songs that I sing, the things that I say about myself, you know, I, I'm not stupid. You know, I, some people that we walk around and we say things like, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't do that. You know, I, I can't achieve the things that I, that I think that God's put in my heart. And those things, if you continue, whatever you continuously rehearse will eventually be performed. Amen. So I believe that if you continue to do that, you continue to say, even if God is still faithful, that God will use what you say to change your world. All right. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's give it up for the next one. Hello, my name is Kalista. Um, <laughs> um, I've gone to church here my entire life, and I'm a school leadership student, like Josh said, and I've been known to be a little bit overly passionate, so just stick with me here. Um, so I promise if you just hear me out for five minutes, I have such a simple truth that if you apply to your life, I promise it can transform the way you see every situation and how you go about your day. So let's go right into it. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understandings, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Come on. So have any of you guys heard of Uber? Okay, well, if you haven't, it's like a taxi service. So you get on your little phone, cute little app comes up and you type in your location and then a map pops up and there's like drivers in your area. So you pick, click on the driver and a little bio will come up and it shows like their name, their car, how many drives they've done successfully, a bunch of information about them. So once you decide which one seems the safest, you can go ahead and click the one that you want and they'll meet you at your location. So they show up at your location and you get in the car and they take you from point A to point B. Well, uh, two weekends ago now, I was in Toronto and I took my first Uber. It was terrifying. I cried a little bit, but it's okay. So um, I, they showed up in this big, like, black Escalade with, like, tinted windows and everything showed up. It was, it was absolutely terrifying. But I got in, right? Trust him. Good. Um, so I got in, and I found myself, like, thinking, how much, like, God is this? God just wants us to get in the car with him and trust him that he's going to take us from point A to point B successfully and safely. Right? So let God be the driver of your life. Just get in and say, God, I don't have to understand. I don't have to understand how you're going to do it or when you're going to do it, but I'm going to trust you that you are going to do it, right? Yeah. Proverbs also says, and one thing I love is to acknowledge him. It doesn't say just keep going about your day. It says to acknowledge him. So when there's situations in your life that seem hopeless, you don't know how you're going to get to the end of it, acknowledge him. That looks like saying, God, I surrender this to you. I don't see the be I don't see all the in between, but I know that you're faithful. And let me tell you, there have been multiple times in my life that situations seem messy, but God has come through every single time. He is always faithful to his word. And the word says that his plans for me are good, not for evil plans to give me a hope and a future. And I have to believe that and stand on that. So, and also don't let worry 
We all worry so much about things that are out of our control, but don't let worry keep you from the blessings and the provision and the protection and everything that God has for you in that season. God knows, he knows the beginning from the end. He goes before you, he goes behind you, he's left and right, top and bottom. He is all around you making a way for you. He has your best interest in mind. So just trust him with that. Know that he's faithful. And like I said, like even, for example, like example in my life, um, transfer, transitioning from high school to college, right? I did not know what I was going to do, if I'm being honest. I didn't know if I was going to take a gap year, if I was going to go to college, if I was going to do the internship when it was the internship at the time or what I was going to do. And I sat down with a mentor in my, life, in my life and he just encouraged me to trust God, just to pray about it and follow the peace. But if I was so worked up and kept myself worked up and I was worrying about the situation, I would have missed out on that peace that God was trying to give me to guide me to where he wanted me to go. And so surrender, like I said, surrender is to cease resistance and submit to authority. So I had to give up my way and trying to keep control of everything because I kind of like to micromanage my life, but um, let go and stop trying to control everything and let him just guide me. And honestly, it is so much easier when we just say, God, I trust you. I don't know how this is going to work out beginning to end, but I trust you. And just like the word says, like stand on the promise in Proverbs 3. That's a promise that he's going to get you, you know, he's going to, when you trust in him, he's going to get you from point A to point B. So find scriptures to stand on. I would encourage you, if nothing else, find scriptures to stand on in your life. I don't know what that situation looks like for you. If it's a job, a marriage, finances, if it's a child that's far from God going into high school to college, whatever that situation is, trust that he is faithful and stand on his promises because his plans for you are good. They're good. I promise you. He's never left your side. He's never forsaken you. He's always right with you. So I just encourage you to stand on his promises. Hello. All right, so... As you guys heard, my name's Colin. My name's Colin Stranathan. As you know, some people need to hear my last name, so I don't know. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you guys about preaching. I know, super, super redundant. <laughs> preaching about preaching. What, you're just going to ramble up there all day? Come on. Okay, so <laughs> if you go on the internet, you go on Google, you know, because we learn everything from Google these days. Um, you get a few different definitions for the word preach. Uh, the first one you're going to come across is the most obvious would be delivering a sermon or um, a religious address. The second is somewhere along the lines of expressing your advocacy for uh, a strong belief of some sort. And then the third definition you'll find is giving, an, giving moral advice in an annoying way. In other words, <laughs> forcing your opinion. You know, you ever been preached at? There you go. That's what that one's saying. <laughs> But see, I'm not, I'm not just here to state my opinion. I'm here to obviously share my beliefs, which, you know, people think beliefs and opinion are the same thing. Well, there's a difference when you look at the Word of God. See, we associate preaching with a pulpit or a platform, but, you know, some of us don't have those gifts. Um, I believe that some people are better face-to-face, -face, and then some people can't even verbally express it. And I'm here to tell you that that's okay. We've just sorted this definition of preaching over a long period of time. Um, if you look in Mark chapter 16, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, um, he specifically says, this, this is what I got from the version that I read, um, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We're all called to preach the gospel. Isn't that good? We're all called to preach the good news. See, I think we set too many limitations on who can preach. It's, I think it's easy to miss the idea that we can preach with our actions and our way of life. See, within the word preach is the word reach, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus reached people. Jesus showed love and mercy with his actions when he healed people and performed miracles as well as sharing grace and truth throughout his messages and parables. Reaching people is who we are as a church. You know, if you volunteered here for any length of time, you'll, you'll see that 
We go to reach people far from God. We grow in our relationship with God. And then we give. Now, if, if you haven't figured it out, if you, if you don't know God by now, I want to let you know, and we're, this is what we do. We preach this. He loves you so much. He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die a very painful death on the cross where he wore your sin and shame and mine. He gives us the choice to live a life that's free from all of that. Isn't that good? Come on. And the choice of eternal life. See, I think when the gospel affects us, actions definitely speak louder than words. We hear that a lot, but I think that if that's true, we preach what we practice. If we practice love, we preach love. If we practice grace, we preach grace. If we practice faithfulness, we preach faithfulness. If we aren't careful, we can take what we hear from a pastor and forget to share it. The gospel is meant to be shared. It's up to us as a church and a community to make an impact in someone's life. Because in, in someone's life, there's a story waiting to be rewritten. Maybe it's, maybe it's something small to you and it's simple as an invitation to a church. Or maybe you just have one conversation with them and it changes their life. If, that, if that's what it takes to save their soul, that's all that matters. Now, I got I to gotta end this a little bit quick. I didn't think I was going to go this long. Um, see, preaching is about pointing back to the cross, pointing back to the greatest servant of all who performed the greatest service of all, sacrifice. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hey, everybody. So my name is Jasmine, if you guys didn't know, and I'm a sophomore in high school. And today I want to share with you a word that's been on my heart for almost a year now. So this is pretty big. And um, I want to look at a verse in Genesis 22, which says this. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. So if you don't know the background of the story, we're looking at a story about Abraham, a character in the Bible, who he wanted to have a son for the longest time, but he couldn't because his wife wasn't able to have children. And then one day God makes him this promise and says, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, and your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. And so Abraham continues to stand on this promise and believe in everything that God had told him. And then one day he does have a son, and he loves his son so much. But then in this verse, when we look at it, we're seeing that God is telling Abraham to sacrifice that one thing that he had always wanted. Essentially, God was saying, give up the one thing you want most. Then I will know that you love me. So today I want to talk to you from the title, Even If, which is getting to the point when you can say, God, I will still love you and I will still trust you even if I don't get that one thing. And I know that one thing <laughs> looks different for a lot of us. You know, for you, that one thing might be wanting to be the captain of your sports team or wanting to get your finances together or wanting to be the most popular person in your school or just wanting to have good kids because, come on, I know, I can be that bad kid sometimes. <laughs> and so I know for me in my life, that one thing was relationships. Because if you don't know me, I am a super, super outgoing person. I love to have friends and I love to talk and I love to be the life of the party. And so for so long, I chased after relationships so hard that that became my identity. And I completely wrapped up everything I was inside of that. And so it got to the point where when that was taken away from me, all it, was, all it left me with was feeling alone, depressed, and rejected. Because the thing about putting that one thing above God is putting your trust in anything other than God will ultimately lead to your destruction. And so what it took for me to get out of that was this. 
I remember going to my room and sitting on my bed. And as I sat there alone, I began to cry as I said, God, I will still love you and I will still trust you even if I never have another friend. And the second I said that, I felt a sense of peace and a sense of restoration and fulfillment flood into the room. And I finally knew, okay, I have purpose because I know that God is for me. And even if I don't have all these things that I might think that I want, his plan is so much better. And it's so much greater than anything that I could ever get on my own. And so (laughs) maybe you're here today and you're saying, well, you know, I would follow God, but, or I would pursue God if this happened. But I want to tell you, life is not about getting through the storm, rather learning how to dance in the rain. And so this looks like saying this, my troubles are small now in in comparison to the glory that will be revealed when I see God face to face and he looks at me and says, good job, my good and faithful servant. Your life is evidence that you love me. And so I'm not gonna spend my time wasting my entire life thinking about how bad things might look when God is in heaven inviting me into so much more. And so... When God sees that you don't have to have that one thing, you don't have to have those relationships. You don't have to have the finances. You don't have to have all the things that you think are more important than him. He will give you exceedingly abundantly above everything that you could ever dream or desire. And I can tell you this from personal experience. I chased so hard after relationships. And when I said, God, I give this to you. I don't need this because I have you. He gave me all of the best relationships, better than anything I could have ever gotten on my own. So I want to tell you guys something today, and I really want you to hold on to this. When you are willing to lose everything that you thought you wanted for God, he will give you everything you never knew you needed. How's everyone doing tonight? Woo! Well, my name's Alexa, and I'm so excited, humbled, and honored to be here with you. And man, I really believe that God's got a word for us. And I want to have a heart-to-heart conversation. And those of you that know me know that these are my favorite. I love these. But man, the past couple years, I walked through this season of extreme refinement. And it felt like everything that I thought that I needed pay attention to the wording. Everything that I thought that I needed was being stripped away from me. I lost a lot of friends that I cared deeply about. I lost um, the confidence in myself and the boldness that I used to have. And at one point, I even questioned my entire calling. And I was at this point where I just felt so low. And I remember talking to God and I said, Father, I feel like I'm being stripped of everything. I feel like I'm being ravaged. And he said, you're not being ravaged, you're being refined. You're not being ravaged, you're being refined. And I wanna speak to you from the title of learning how to lean, learning how to become fully dependent on God, not a social media status, not a relationship or a friendship, not an ability of our own, but learning how to be dependent on the Father. Because how dangerous of a place it is to be when we are reaching for everything but the hands of our God. I wanna read out of John chapter 15. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. Starting in verse one, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear even more fruit. And I wanna pose to you this this thought that maybe those things are being ripped away, not because they were necessarily bad, not because that relationship was bad for you, but maybe because they they weren't adding to your growth. They were keeping you back. And here's the thing that I've learned is sometimes people are unknowingly bringing their baggage along with you on your journey. And where you're going, you need to travel lightly. So sometimes that refinement means losing the baggage and it may not make sense. It may hurt now. It may be confusing, but let me tell you that God is good and you're not being ravaged. You're being refined so that you can experience unrestrained and abundant growth. Moving on, moving on in verse four. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
I think a lot of times we wanna fast forward to this place in our lives where God is taking us to new heights, where he's opening up door after door of opportunity, where we're experiencing this abundant favor of God without actually being planted in what he says, without actually being rooted in who God is. And how many of you know the moment a storm comes, you're gonna be blown away. But I think in order to experience that growth that we want, we need to learn how to lean. We need to grow downwards so that we can grow upwards and be sustained. And what I realized is when we are relying on sources that are literally, literally unable to sustain us, it's like settling for a glass of water when you're thirsty because it temporarily quenches a thirst. When you have the well that never runs dry that we can go to again and again and again and receive eternal fulfillment. Come on, somebody. That'll preach. And I learned something interesting the other day, and it was the olive tree. It is able to thrive in extreme conditions due to its extensive root system. Its root system is essentially its foundation. And how many of you know our foundation is the rock that is Jesus Christ? It's immovable. It doesn't matter what life throws at us. It doesn't matter how we're feeling. When we plant and root ourselves in who God is and what he says and in his word and who he says that we are, it doesn't matter what life throws at us. We're gonna be immovable and unshakable because we are leaning on the God and the Father that can do all things. And so I wanna encourage you, if you find yourself in that season where everything just is being stripped away from you, lean into it even more. Become dependent on who God is. And man, I may have lost a lot, but I had to come to a place where God was my only option so that I could truly understand that he was all that I ever needed. And I wanna encourage you with that. You're not being ravaged, you're being refined. Lean in, learn how to fully abide in love again.